Good morning, Taylor. My name is Sarah Mangan, and I have the honor of serving as student body president. Hello, Taylor. My name is Jorge Martinez Santiago. <laughs> and I have the honor of serving as student body vice president. We have the pleasure of introducing our university president today. Dr. Michael Lindsay is a scholar, author, and advocate for Christ. He comes to our university with deep insight into leadership and the role of Christianity in American culture. Dr. Lindsay formerly served as president at Gordon College in Massachusetts. Prior to Gordon, he served as a faculty member at Rice University where his teaching and research received multiple awards. An author of two dozen scholarly publications and numerous books, Faith in the Halls of Power was nominated for the nonfiction Pulitzer Prize. Dr. Lindsay earned his PhD in sociology from Princeton University and graduate theological degrees from Wycliffe Hall at Oxford University and Princeton Theological Seminary. He is a summa cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa graduate at, from Baylor University, where he was named the Outstanding Young Alumnus. Dr. Michael Lindsay and his wife, Rebecca, moved to Wenham, Massachusetts with their three beautiful daughters, Elizabeth, who is 17, and their twin girls, Caroline and Emily, who are 11. We are excited to work alongside Dr. Lindsay, and we look forward to being able to see you and your family around campuses in this coming year. Now, without further ado, please join us as we welcome Dr. Michael Lindsay onto the stage as he shares with us his, uh, his message this morning. Taylor, welcome. We are so excited to be here, and uh, thank you very much for that. We are just uh, thrilled. It's an exciting time. Uh, we're starting our 175th anniversary year, and you're going to learn a vocabulary word this morning when you pick up your game day t-shirt on the way out. I won't spoil it for you, but you'll be one leg up on passing your GRE exam once you wear the t-shirt. It's helping us to celebrate 175 years of God's faithfulness to this amazing institution. A lot of people have asked uh, what it is that drew us to Taylor. I have to say, first and foremost, it's the amazing people that we've gotten to know as part of this community. And we are so deeply honored. Rebecca, Elizabeth, Caroline, Emily, and I are just so excited to be here. There's a long, a long trail of people who have had amazing faithfulness and commitment to advancing the gospel who have Taylor connections. One of my predecessors in the presidency at Gordon was actually a Taylor alumnus, a man named Harold Ockengay, who after graduating from Taylor, ended up uh, launching a number of important things like Christianity Today, the National Association of Evangelicals, World Relief, and he was the founding president of both Fuller Theological Seminary and Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. That's the kind of person who has been trained in the same institution and you are continuing his legacy of faithfulness and fruitfulness for the gospel. We love the place that uh, Taylor has become, a place of deep discipleship that happens in residence life, as well as spiritual formation that occurs through our great programs in athletics and the arts, and we're gonna have an amazing year in both, as well as the mentorship, support, and deep formation that occurs from our faculty, both inside and outside the classroom. As someone who comes from the outside, I can just say, these are amazing, even enviable gifts that other institutions would beg to have. We just take them for granted here at Taylor, but they are very special because they're part of what makes this place so extraordinary. Finally, we're drawn to Taylor because we are convinced God is on the move here. We cannot wait to see what he is gonna do in and among us in the days ahead. I don't say this lightly, but I do say it with strong conviction. I am persuaded that the Lord wants to do something exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or imagine. 
in this 175th anniversary year. So buckle up, let's see what God might do. The title of my talk this morning in chapel is Blessing at a Cost. Our scripture, as Dr. Dayton read, is from my favorite book of the Bible, the book of Philippians. You may recall that Philippi was actually a Roman colony, the site of the very first church founded in the West, according to Acts 16, with the help and direction of the Apostle Paul. He loved this congregation deeply because they had sent support and aid to him when he was in prison. This summer, our family had the chance actually to visit Philippi in Greece. I was reminded once again how impactful this very small little New Testament book of just four chapters has been to those of us who've read it over and over again. Last summer, Rebecca and I celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary. We've had an amazing journey together. And uh, thank you. I can testify that marriage can be one of the best blessings of a full and happy life. But we, like every other couple, have had our moments. One stands out in particular. We hadn't been married for very long. One night, as we were settling into bed, I had taken a soda up to bed that I was gonna sip on while I read a book. For our wedding, we had been given this delicate lace tablecloth that was placed over sort of an end table that functioned as my nightstand. It looked so nice in our bedroom, which was decorated in blue and white. I'd gotten into bed and was looking down at the book uh, that I was going to read. I wasn't really paying that much attention. And while reaching over to the nightstand to grab the drink, I somehow knocked the drink over and it spilled all over the lace fabric. I jumped out of bed, grabbed some towels to clean up the mess, quickly washed the lace fabric before a stain could set in. The next morning, I set it out so that it could dry while I was at work. When I got home from work that night, I took out the iron and the starch and I ironed it and put it back properly into place like a dutiful husband would do. And then later that evening, I again took a soda to enjoy while reading in bed. I got into bed, reached over to grab the drink to sip on it, and lo and behold, for the second night in a row, I did the exact same thing knocking over another large glass of soda all over the lace tablecloth. I immediately got up to grab a towel, but as I did, my darling wife did something a bit unusual. Instead of jumping out of bed to lend a helping hand, she burst into laughter. Now, I don't mean a giggle. We're talking about a loud and hearty laugh from the belly. Apparently, my actions were so entertaining that she could not stop laughing. She laughed as I went to go get towels from the bathroom and tried to mop up the drink. She laughed as I took the lace tablecloth to the bathtub to wash it out for a second night in a row. She continued to laugh at me for the next several minutes as I raced to ensure that the stain would not set on her beloved lace tablecloth. In my new husbandly sort of way, I told her to knock it off. It wasn't that funny. But for some reason, that only made her laugh harder. I endured her mockery for what seemed like an endless season before I finally decided I could not take it anymore. I was at the sink of the bathroom as she continued to cackle from our bed. And my eye happened to notice a small little plastic cup on the counter. I can't say that I was exactly thinking straight at that moment, but for some reason I thought a light splash of cool water might bring her back to her senses. So I filled the cup with some water and I just proceeded to gingerly throw in her general direction a light dousing of water to sort of take the temperature down. Now I must admit, oh, it gets better. I must admit that what I thought would be just a trace of water ended up being more water than I had really expected. And what I thought would be like a light Presbyterian baptism kind of sprinkle could have been interpreted to her as a forceful Baptist dousing. (laughs) I thought it would be a cute little gesture, but unfortunately that's not how my bride took it. At first, her face had a look of shock on it, sort of the way that tourists visiting SeaWorld look when Shamu hits them with a wall of water. But as soon as the bracing cold water no longer poured from her hair and face, and those moments of shock seemed to pass, she developed what can only be described as a look of fiery determination. 
she lunged toward me, but then walked right past me into the bathroom where apparently she also knew to find a cup of water. And before I knew it, she threw water on me. Now, I couldn't believe it. Here she was laughing at me and my misfortune and she happened to get a little wet in the process when she goes and deliberately throws water on me, her loving and devoted husband. In a stunned state, I can only say that human instincts seemed to take over at that moment and what proceeded was an all out water fight in our bedroom. Looking back, it probably wasn't our finest moment at husband and wife, but we did have a lot of fun. In many ways, life is a lot like that water fight. We face challenges, surprises, disappointments all the time. It's part of being human. The key is how we use these challenging moments as occasions to practice and cultivate virtue in our lives or not. It's part of what it means to grow up in the faith. Every day, you and I are given chances to develop Christian virtue in our life and to demonstrate the love of Christ in various encounters that we have. We face tests of our character every single day. How we respond to those tests have a way of reinforcing and developing the person that we become. Every single day, we are being shaped into the person and character that we'll be known for the rest of our life. Our passage today in the book of Philippians describes one of those moments in the life of Paul and how it was that he responded. His response can be characterized as three different modes of living that I hope all of us would be able to embody in the life of faith. First, a life transformed by the grace of God. Second, one that's inspired to obedience in the face of uncertainty. And third, a life that's marked by joy in serving other people. We begin with a life transformed by the grace of God. Imagine the following. Imagine that you're accused of a crime that you did not commit. Imagine your religious brothers and sisters actually attempt to not just arrest you, but actually murder you while you're in custody. And then you are held under duress for two years without a trial. You end up being transported on a boat, which ends up becoming shipwrecked, and you nearly drown. And then you're giving a death sentence for a crime for which you are entirely innocent. How would you respond? That's exactly the circumstances the Apostle Paul finds himself in. In that moment, he writes a personal note to some of his very best friends in a little place called Philippi. And he doesn't talk about the madness of the accusations or defending himself. Instead, he focuses on giving thanks for the grace of God. In verse 14, he writes, quote, I am in chains for Christ, and because of this, most of the followers of Jesus have become far more sure of themselves in the faith than ever before. Friends, I want to be like Paul. When I face adversity and challenge, I want to be so captivated by the grace of God that my first reaction, my gut instinct, is one of gratitude and thanks instead of complaining or trying to justify myself. A life that is marked with great thanksgiving for the extraordinary grace of God. Second, Paul exhorts us to obedient, obedient courage in the midst of great uncertainty. He writes in verse 20 of Philippians chapter one, quote, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. It's amazing how courageous the Apostle Paul was. He doesn't give in to anxiety or fears, which surely had to have been knocking on the door of his heart. I don't know about you, but the last 18 months have been incredibly challenging for me personally. It actually started before COVID, but the pandemic did not make it any easier. From time to time, I'm gonna try and share a little bit of my personal story, and this morning, I wanted to share with you about my journey in this season. Some time ago, I developed this sense where I would get butterflies in my stomach that would represent some kind of low-grade worry or anxiety in my soul. Some days they would start in my very first waking moments. Many days, my first conscious thought would be about the butterflies and what was causing them. 
for a number of years, I've actually had trouble going to sleep during seasons of stress and worry. It's happened so much that I actually have thought of it as somewhat normal. But I want to take the admonition by the Apostle Paul seriously when he says, I expect and hope that I will have sufficient courage so that Christ will be exalted in my body. I want the butterflies to calm down, the worry and anxiety to dissipate. Now, there are any number of things that could happen in the next few days, next few weeks that could keep me up at night or to get those butterflies going in my stomach. It's like a meteor shower of worries and anxieties that can fill my head when I close my eyes or even begin to pray. Worries about the spread of the virus, about people on campus not doing the right thing, about people I love getting sick, about negative things happening to our campus, or a whole host of other items that we face. But I also found that the last year has provided opportunities for me to do some things that have actually been helpful in this regard. In a way, they've helped instill sufficient courage, as Paul described, so that Christ might be exalted. I mentioned once before that I started a gratitude journal. Almost every night, I try to identify three things for which I'm grateful and thankful from that day. Sometimes I mention the names of people that I love or that I work with, or of serendipities that came along the way, or answers to prayer that I had not been expecting. If I happen to miss a day, I go back and try and fill it in to catch up. It's amazing how once I started that process, it allowed the last thoughts of my day to be filled with a spirit of gratitude and the butterflies seemed to fly away. Second, I've become very aware of the importance of memorizing scripture. This hasn't always been a part of my own spiritual journey, but as a family, we made a commitment that we were gonna try and pick up this practice more regularly. Committing more of the Bible to memory actually provides a great resource for us when we need to remind ourselves of the courage that we require so that Christ can be exalted in our lives. If that's not been part of your journey, I wanna encourage you to think about choosing a passage of scripture that's meaningful and trying to commit it to memory. Third, I've become more attentive to the importance of limiting the roles of electronic devices in my life. I simply don't check as many news sources as I used to. I'm disciplining myself to put the phone away and to try and develop more of a contemplative life, which has been true for most believers throughout the centuries. My friend Andy Crouch wrote a book a few years ago. It's a simple one called The TechWise Family, but it's filled with very good practical ideas. One thing is that he makes sure to charge his devices far away from his bed so that he doesn't get distracted as he's trying to rest. If it's not these practices, I would encourage you to earnestly seek out the Lord's direction so that you could establish good habits as we start a new academic year, one that might draw you closer to the Lord. As we're transformed by God's grace and pursue lives of obedient courage through discipline and practice, even in the midst of uncertainty, we can thrive through lives of joyful service. Paul says, quote, it's true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others preach it out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what's it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is pre preached. And because of this, I can truly say, I rejoice. So as we start a new academic year, in the quiet of this moment, just you thinking about your own life, how would you assess your level of joy? Are you one who is regularly rejoicing? Because we have every reason to rejoice, even in the midst of challenge and uncertainty. Paul sets an incredible example for all of us. Despite all of his hardships, all of his challenges, despite his frustrations, disappointments, the injustice that he faced, he concludes none of this matters because in every way Christ can be preached. Because of that, he can rejoice. Until the coronavirus pandemic is really behind us, there are gonna be inconveniences that we have to put up with. But they become opportunities for us to demonstrate joyful service to others. I'm not going to say this as a way of trying to guilt you into certain action, but I do want to offer a pastoral word as your president. We're asking that when you come into this chapel service, you wear masks for the next two weeks. Some of you are doing that now, some of you are not. But I'm confident by the time we come on Friday, you'll all be wearing masks. 
The reason is because you don't do this for yourself. We do it to try and show love of neighbor. Whether it's wearing masks to try and help others, to making sure that we stay home if we're not feeling well, or perhaps even go so far as to walk across the street to the pharmacy to get the vaccine. We do this as a way of genuinely showing love of neighbor. And in case you need a name or a face to associate with this particular act of love, I would like for you to think of my daughter, Elizabeth. No doubt, some of you have seen Elizabeth around campus and more of you will get a chance to see her in the weeks ahead because we now live on the Taylor campus. She'll take family walks with us around campus and will regularly be enjoying Chick-fil-A. But Elizabeth has a very rare genetic disorder and one side effect of her genetic disorder is a condition known as neutropenia, dangerously low white blood cell count. I can't give Elizabeth an infusion. I can't do anything to protect her from this condition. But when she was diagnosed with this at age three, the doctors told us if there is a pandemic, you really have to be very careful because her chances of surviving, if she received, uh, got the virus, her chance of surviving would be very, very low. We have been very concerned about Elizabeth's well-being, and it's one of those things that can keep me up at night or cause the butterflies in my stomach. But Rebecca and I do not live in fear. Part of the reason we're not gripped with fear is because we have trust and confidence that we are living in a Christian community that will do the right thing. Not thinking about our own interests, but looking out for the interests of others as we're admonished in Philippians chapter two. We trust that your joyful service, as Paul calls it, will entail your being considerate to Elizabeth and everyone else in our community is vulnerable until we get this thing behind us. I think it's quite instructive that throughout the New Testament, we are admonished to actually honor Christ in what we do with our bodies. Romans chapter 12 says, the need to act responsibly with our bodies is a way that we actually worship God. Therefore, I urge you brothers and sisters, Paul writes, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. What we do with our bodies actually is a way that we worship God. So all the measures we continue to take on campus and beyond, being mindful of older people in our community, the kindness shown to others on campus who approach the virus differently, decision to stay home if we feel unwell, we do these small little gestures, not as a political statement or as trying to sort of choose something in the culture wars. We do it because we are a Christian community that wants to show love of God and love of neighbor. Navigating the pandemic is just one way in which we can pursue lives of joyful service, just as Paul admonished the church at Philippi. It is so good to see you all back, to have a vibrant campus community with all of the energy and good things that have happened. It's a real answer to prayer. I urge us to live in a way that we pursue our lives in community in such a way that follows the example of Paul in Philippians 1. May we be a people who have truly been transformed by the grace of God, who demonstrate obedient courage in the face of uncertainty, difficulty, and injustice, and who joyfully serve one another as a spiritual act of worship. This is how we honor Jesus Christ in this place at this time. A preacher I really admired once said that the things that cost us will be the things that end up blessing us. It's my prayer that the things that we do during this anniversary year will end up not only costing us, but be a source of great blessing and encouragement to all of us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the ministry of Taylor University that for 175 years has been faithful to the call of God. We do pray for all of the sadness and difficulty and trauma that we see in the world around us. We pray for Afghanistan and our worry, especially for our Christian brothers and sisters in that land. We pray for the persecuted church there, throughout the Middle East, in Asia, Latin America, Africa, even in our own communities, people who stand up for the gospel, but who suffer slights or injustice. We pray, Father, for the division and derision that we see all around us. May that not be true of us at Taylor. May we be a people who are so united around the person of Jesus that we can work through differences in a way that actually shows our deep and abiding love for you. And may we, oh God, be a changed people because we have encountered your word in our lives. We ask you, Lord, to take our minds 
and to think through them. Take our words and speak through them. Take our hands and work through them because we have encountered you this morning. This we pray in the strong name of Christ our Savior. Amen. And now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or imagine. According to the power that is at work within us, unto him be glory in the church throughout all generations, world without end. Amen. God bless you all.